Welcome to the continuation of our community symposium, Freedom to Expand, Gordon Parks. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Mason. Dr. Mason is Associate Professor in the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia. His areas of specialization are Southern African, Southern Africa, Modern Africa, and the history of photography. John earned his BA from the University of Cincinnati, went on to get an MA M. Phil at Yale, and then his PhD at Yale. Dr. Mason has written extensively on early 19th century South African history, especially the history of slavery, South African popular culture, especially the Cape Town New Year's Carnival and jazz, and the history of photography. He is now working on Gordon Parks and American Democracy, a book about the ways in which Parks Life magazine photo essays on social justice and the books that he published during the civil rights era challenged Americans' notions of citizenship and at the same time made him one of the era's most significant interpreters of the black experience. John is also a documentary photographer in his own right with a long-term interest in exploring race and gender in American motorsports. And I encourage you to Google him and go to his website. Um, his photo essays are, are worthy of exhibition as well, and actually have been exhibited quite a bit. Uh, John's also an active musician, performing with the Charlottesville and University Symphony Orchestra, the Lynchburg, Virginia Symphony Orchestra, and the New Lyric Theater, among other groups. Um, he uh, contributes regularly to Elling Elling Ellingtonia, the publication of the Duke Ellington Society. Um, he's talking about a Renaissance man, and it sounds to me like we've got a rena Renaissance man making that uh, study. John Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. That was um, a wonderful introduction, and some of it was true. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, this is my second trip to Wichita, and in these two trips, I have managed to make friends, and I'm really happy about that. Some of the friends are at the Ulrich. I count Bob among them. I count Jana and Jennifer and Sally, who have made this particular trip just really easy on me. Also at the Ulrich is James Porter. Now, James Porter designed visual justice. I got into town last Sunday, and I got into town just in time to check into my hotel and then come down here just before it closed. Now, I consulted on the exhibition, and we had a lot of back and forth between James and Bob and me, but I hadn't seen it. You know, I had an idea of what it looked like, but I hadn't seen it. And when I walked in, it blew me away. It really did. It put me on cloud nine. It's a magnificent installation. And I just have to give a shout out to James Porter for, for that. <laughs> so while I'm here, I'm trying to get some research done. Because as I think has been mentioned already, the Gordon Parks papers are in your library. They're in special collections. Um, where they're under the guardianship, uh, the stewardship, I think, of Lorraine Madway and her incredible staff. And I think one of them, Mary, is here. And um, they've also made this just a really terrific trip. Um, I, I can't tell you, look, I'm an historian. I, I'm not an art historian. I'm just a straight up historian. And when we write, we're not allowed to make it up. <laughs> you have to have evidence. And the kind of evidence that I need to write tellingly about Gordon Parks can be pound in the photographs that he left behind, absolutely. And the people that I will interview who knew him or were his children or grandchildren, that's absolutely important too. But the papers are vital. 
And the papers that you've got are an essential part of trying to make sense of this immensely complicated man and his hugely significant career. So working in special collections has also been a real joy. So with that, um, let me take out my phone and start the timer. Okay, so I'm actually not kidding about this. Um, this is a different slideshow than I arrived with, and it's been changed by things that I found in the archive this week. Um, you know, uh, the two weeks, or almost two weeks, that I spent here last summer, and then the few days that I've had here on this trip, I really feel like I'm skimming the surface of what's in the archive and special collections. But every time I open a folder, there's something new and something that slightly or maybe sometimes greatly changes the way that I think about Gordon Parks. And some of the slides that you're going to see here, uh, I couldn't have put together before I left Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, just a few days ago. So, Gordon Parks. And one more set of thank you uh, to the Gordon Parks Foundation, which has really been terrific to work with. They're very cooperative, they like what I'm doing, and they make his photographs available to me to do things like show them to you. So I'm writing a book, and the book is going to make an argument. The, go the argument's going to be that Gordon Parks has been misunderstood, or only partially understood that when people think about Gordon Parks, they think of him as the creator of beautiful and sometimes iconic photographs. Photographs that touch people, photographs that reach their hearts, and photographs that sometimes get them, uh, get them thinking. But for the most part, he's been understood within an art history context. And he hasn't been taken seriously as the documentary photographer, photojournalist, and journalist that he was. The argument I'm going to make is that the series of photo essays that he did for Life magazine between 1948 and the early 1970s on issues relating to poverty, to race, and to social justice made him one of the foremost interpreters of the African American experience of his generation. Photo essays like Harlem Gang Leader, this gets called segregation story. Um, Life magazine, as you can see, called it the restraints open and hidden, 1956. 1963, the black Muslims. By 1963, he was also writing the text. And this is also something that people haven't looked at. That he, almost uniquely among mainstream American photojournalists, was producing text that ran alongside the stories that he photographed. And this text, I'm gonna get back to a text, but the text and the photographs together combine to be really unique productions in his era. Um, this gets called the Harlem Family, an impoverished Harlem family, the Black Panthers, a whole series of these, and I, I haven't shown you all of them. The evidence is strong that he not only made them and life published them, but people responded to them. You know, in the archive, in your library, are hundreds of letters to the editor of Life magazine and hundreds of letters to Gordon Parks himself from readers who were responding to his stories. Did they always like what he was doing? No, they did not always like what they, some of these letters are condemnatory. Some of them are saying he's wasting his time. Some of them are saying he's a dangerous man, promoting dangerous ideas. But most of them are from people who have really been touched in the heart and moved. Not just in the heart, but also in the intellect. So they're writing letters where they're not only talking about their emotions, they're talking about their thoughts as well. They're pouring out their hearts to him. You know, Life magazine had a, uh, it reached tens of millions of people, really, tens of millions of people. Even if you didn't subscribe, you saw it in your auntie's house, or you saw it in your neighbor's house, or the beauty parlor, or the barbershop, or your dentist's office. Life magazine was all over the place. And 
when Parks was working for Life, he was working in a media environment where we did not have cable television, which is zillions of channels. We did not have the internet, obviously. We didn't have Facebook. You know, we were working in a much narrower media environment where it was much more likely that everybody shared something. And Life magazine was one of those things that not everybody shared, but pretty close to everybody shared. So he's reaching these tens of millions of middle-class white Americans, and some of them are really pouring out their hearts. So when I say that he was significant, I'm saying that he told these tens of millions of ordinary middle-class white Americans, he told them things they didn't know about black people and the black experience, and they responded in a variety of ways, but sometimes deeply, deeply touched. Talking about Gordon Park's photography is the easy part. Uh, talking about him is the hard part. He's an immensely complicated man. You know, he was not simply a great photojournalist who worked on these gritty stories about social justice issues. He's a very good fashion photographer, and he loved it. Um, from beginning to end of his career, he did fashion photography. And if you, you've been to the Ulrich and you've seen those beautiful experimental color photographs that he made, this was also deeply meaningful to him. If we, if we focus like I am on just his photojournalism, I'm going to be focusing on just a piece. But of course, if I was writing about every photograph that he ever took, I'd also be focusing on just a piece of, photo, of Gordon Parks. He's also a poet, a good poet. He was also a novelist, a good novelist. He was an essayist, a very good essayist. He was a composer. He was a filmmaker. He wrote a ballet. <laughs> there were, there were a, a million different things. And um, there's a man in, in Wichita, I haven't seen him tonight, called um, Charlie McAfee. And um, Charlie and Gordon were very good friends. And I once asked Charlie, um, I, I never met Gordon Parks, even though it was our lives overlapped, and I, I regret I was never in his presence. Um, but Charlie knew him really well. And uh, I was telling a story that was told to me by um, um, Adger Cowens, who's a very fine photographer and painter. But when, he, when Adger was young, and Gordon Parks was in his 40s, Adger assisted Gordon Parks. He worked as his photographic assistant. But he also went to his house and they played basketball together. And Adger said, Gordon could beat the pants out of me in basketball. It, well into his 40s, Adger had just graduated from college and he's a very fit and athletic guy. Gordon was also a really good tennis player. Really good. Really good amateur tennis player. So I asked Charlie McAfee, did Gordon Parks ever do anything he was bad at? And Charlie said, no. Um, yeah, he's... In any case, these are the standard quotes, or some of the standard quotes, and I think they're really important. I like them a lot. I was born with the stubborn need to be somebody. You know, he's a guy who came up from poverty. You know, when he was in Fort Scott, living with his family, when his mother was still alive, they were poor. They were spiritually rich. And this is not a biography, so I'm not going to get into that, but the spiritually rich part is really important part of the Gordon Park story. But he did start out from almost nothing in terms of financial terms. After his mother died, he moves to Minneapolis, St. Paul, drops out of school, is homeless for a while, indulges in petty crime for a while, then works a series of dead-end jobs, and he becomes the person that we know as Gordon Parks. I mean, it's an immense thing. And one of the things I'm thinking about is what set the fire that drove him? You know, he was very talented. He was really smart. But talent and brains will only get you so far. The other thing he had was this immense capacity for hard work. And he never had to push himself. Nope, you know, everybody I know tells me, no, he never had to push himself. He had this restless energy that always had to be working and always had to be creating. And I think that I was born with the stubborn need to be somebody. Well, that's a quote that helps us understand that drive. And then the other part of him, the part that wants to use his camera and his typewriter as weapons against bigotry and poverty, as he said here. That's another part of the Gordon Parks story. And, you know, conventionally, you combine those things, and that's the way we think about Gordon Parks, right? It is. Well, <laughs> I was in the archive, and I found this. 
over there in special collections. Um, I hate reading PowerPoint um, slides, but I'm going to read it anyway. His life, it seems, was one magnificent celebration. He was truly revered, a great man, a superb dude, <laughs> and a fine cat, and a wonderful human being to just about everybody who knew him. I mean, this really sounds like Parks, doesn't it? And um, this also sounds like Parks, and the more I think about Gordon Parks, the more this is very meaningful to me. He did seem somewhat of a mystery sometimes, even to himself. He's almost impossible to explain. It's probably the way he wanted it. it. Wasn't his thing to be thoroughly understood, and those who knew him didn't even try to do it. Just sat back and enjoyed. <laughs> That's Gordon Parks talking about Duke Ellington. Um, uh, Parks wrote an essay on Duke Ellington, and uh, it, there it is, hidden away in the archive. Never, never had been published. And I found this, and I said, wow. You know, I don't know if Gordon Parks was consciously talking about himself when he's writing about Duke Ellington, but that, th those two quotes really fit, because he was a dude. He was a fine cat. You know, he... <sighs> He was immensely cultured and sophisticated, but he's also a cat, and he's cool. And that mystery about him is something that everybody will tell you. You know, he's a tremendously warm and loving person, you know, but nobody's convinced that they ever really got under his skin. So, I was saying talking about the photographs is pretty easy. Um, yeah, I'm kidding, but it's easier than talking about the man. I liked what Jamal just had to say over at the Ulrich. Um, Jamal is looking at Gordon Park's photographs and he's looking at the way that his photographs fit into a tradition of African-American photography, of African-Americans trying to reinvent the way that black people are represented photographically, the way that we're depicted photographically, because the way that we've been depicted visually has been far too often in terms of demeaning stereotypes. The, you know, it goes back to the days of slavery, the laughing slave, the happy slave, the dangerous thug, um, the stupid uh, step and fetch it, the mammy. You know, there are all these stereotypes, and they've been really uh, dominant in popular culture. Less so now, thank God, uh, but in Gordon Park's lifetime, they were dominant in popular culture. And he was part of a tradition that is trying to reinvent the visual representation, the visual depiction of African Americans. It's absolutely true. But the thing is that we place him in that tradition. When he was learning photography, he basically had to invent himself. As far as I can tell, when he's learning photography, and during his apprenticeship, he was not aware of other black photographers. There were plenty of black photographers throughout American history. One of the first people to bring photography to the United States in 1839 was an African American. So we have a long history of African American photography and superb photograph photographers. I'm not aware that Gordon Parks knew any of those in his early days. But he was aware of another tradition of American photography, and I'm certainly going to place him in this tradition. It's a tradition of American, sometimes gets called social documentary photographer, uh, photography. I'm not going to give you a history lesson, but I'll just show you some representative um, examples. Lewis Hine, early 20th century, best known for his photographs of child laborers. Um, and he did work for the National Child Labor Commission. He was a crusader against child labor, and his photographs that he often made in circumstances that were dangerous to himself, his photographs of child workers did change hearts and minds and contributed mightily to laws that outlawed the use of child labor in the United States. But another thing about Lewis Hine is that Lewis Hine understood that the photograph standing by itself is ambiguous. Photograph is a bit like a poem. Everybody who looks at it reads it differently. And if you're doing social documentary photography, you kind of want to nail down the meaning. You know, you don't want somebody 
looking at this little boy and saying, well, he looks pretty happy. No, you don't want that. <laughs> he's an exploited worker, and he's seven. Um, so Hein combined words and images. I think this is really important to understanding Gordon Parks. You know, he wanted to write text to go along with his images from almost the beginning of his time at Life magazine, maybe from the beginning. You know, in the Gordon Parks papers, in your library, is a draft of an article, uh, a, a, a text that he wrote to accompany the unpublished Fort Scott story. Now, I'm not going to talk about Fort Scott because you can hear all about that tomorrow when Karen Haas, the curator, comes down to talk about it. And she's, she's brilliant, and her essay about Fort Scott's story is really, really brilliant. But that draft is clearly a literary draft. He wanted to write a literary text to accompany his photographs. And, and I th I'm not going to say that he learned this from Hein, but he and Hein understood that the photograph alone doesn't speak for itself. Not if you want to do what he's doing. He's not creating art objects. He's creating, he's creating documentary photography, photojournalism. Who else? Dorothea Lange. Well, I do know he learned from Dorothea Lange. You read his first autobiography, A Choice of Weapons. He gets to Washington, D.C., still in his apprenticeship as a photographer. He wants to work for the FSA, the famous Farm Security Administration Photographic Project. And he gets down there, and Roy Stryker knows things. <laughs> Roy Stryker immediately understands this kid's really naive, and he's got a lot to learn about photography. One of the first things he did was he sent him into the archive of the Farm Security Administration's photographic archive and said, look at everything that's been shot. And that was great photography. Walker Evans shot for the Farm Security Administration. So did Dorothea Lange. And, you know, Dorothea Lange, the superb photographer, and among other things, you know, she's known for the warmth, the compassion, the emotionality of her photographs. The one thing that's little known about Dorothea Lange is that she wrote long captions, long captions. Um, she worked like a sociologist or maybe an amateur ethnographer. In any case, she really wanted you not only to see this image of this mother and this child on the road somewhere in Oklahoma. You know, I think this is California, <laughs> in California. But she wanted you to understand their story. She also wanted you to understand this. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I, you know, we want the depression to look like this, right? And if somebody shows us the depression looking like this, we're going to say, oh, no, that's false. That can't be real. But she tells us what happened. She's making this picture when the dad comes up. And he says, what are you doing? She says, I'm making a picture. She says, my, my kid's face is dirty. My, my wife looks haggard. So he gets a cloth, runs back into the gas station, gets it wet with water, comes out, washes everybody's face, and they make this. <laughs> well, I think this is just as real as the other one, because this is the aftermath of that father insisting this is the way he wants his family to, remem to be remembered. This is the way he wants his family to be depicted. Margaret Burke White. Life magazine. You know, I'm not going to say that uh, he studied Margaret Bourke White's photographs, but he's certainly aware of her. I mean, she was, in her lifetime, she was one of the most famous photographers on the face of the earth. In fact, her biographer, Vicki Goldberg, says that she was not one of the most famous photographers on the face of the earth. She was one of the most famous women on the face of the earth, period. Um, in her lifetime, she was. And you know, Life did a lot of different things, and a lot of what Life published was just fluff, but a lot of it was really serious. And Parks was working with a magazine that had a history, a tradition, of doing serious photojournalism. I'm an historian of South Africa, and I first started writing about photography when I discovered this photo essay by Margaret Bork White, published in 1950. Nobody had ever paid any attention to it before, and I said, this is worth an article. Um, it's good. It's really good. Her analysis of class exploitation and racial oppression in South Africa, it stands up. It stands up today in 2000, when was I writing this? 2013. Um, yeah. And, of course, she's not only analyzing South African society, but she's photographing it, and her photographs, you know, 
this is an iconic photograph. It's that good. She also knew how to tug on heartstrings, and certainly Gordon Parks knew how to do that too. The other thing I want to do is I want to insist on Gordon Park's place within the photographic pantheon. You open up histories of American photography, and Parks is there, but you get a lot more Walker Evans, you get a lot more W. Eugene Smith. Yeah, sure, I mean, these are fantastic photographers, powerful photographers. And Walker Evans is there because people believe that he said something real and genuine and essential about American society. And I have no doubt that he did. And then there's Robert Frank. So if you're gonna talk about two photographers who are sort of in everybody's top five list, it's Robert Frank and Walker Evans, and they're often paired. Because these two books of photography coming at different times are seen to be something that is capturing something fundamental about what America is. As the cover of this book suggests that Frank was much more attuned to the way that, that racial oppression, white supremacy, is built into the fabric of America. He knew that. He was a foreigner, probably easier for him to see or to accept. Nothing wrong with Walker Evans or with um, Robert Frank, and I think they deserve their place in the Pantheon. But I'm going to insist that Gordon Parks belongs there too. He never published a book like Walker Evans' American Photographs or like The Americans by Robert Frank. But if you look at his production as a whole, somebody could make that book. That book where we're getting another eye, another vision, another sensibility, another intelligence, and another heart showing us something real, true, and essential about American society. He made his most famous photograph at the very beginning of his serious photographic career. He had just arrived in Washington, D.C. He had a fellowship from the Rosenwald Fund. The Rosenwald Fund funded um, African-American education uh, in the first part of the 20th century and also gave fellowships to African-American artists. Parks had won one on the strength of an exhibition in Chicago a uh, very early exhibition of his photography. He'd won this. But it was a, a fellowship that was designed to further his career in photography, to further his education in photography. And he said, well, I want to go to work for the FSA, for the Farm Security Administration. It was the most famous collection of photographers on the face of the earth. And he also knew that he had a lot to learn from Roy Stryker. Roy Stryker was the head of the unit the photographic unit. He wasn't a photographer himself, but he knew everything about photography. At least he knew everything about how photography works, how photography works on people, how photography reaches people. So he goes to work with Stryker, goes into Stryker's office. Now this is a story Gordon Parks told many, 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 many times during his life. Goes into Stryker's office for the first time. Stryker looks at him and immediately sizes him up as somebody who's very naive. <laughs> you know, he's just come from Chicago a few years in Chicago, spent most of his young adulthood in Minneapolis, St. Paul. He didn't understand Washington, D.C. at all. Washington, D.C. was a very southern town. I mean, if you were in Washington, you may as well have been in Birmingham as if you were a black person. He knew Parks didn't understand this. So he told Parks to do some things, gave him some assignments, go to a, uh, go to a department store, buy a coat, have lunch downtown, go see a movie. And you can imagine what happened. Uh, the department store refused to sell him a coat. Uh, the lunch counter ran him out. And uh, the movie theater said, we don't even have a balcony for people like you. So he goes back to Stryker's office. He's furious. He's furious. And he says, give me my camera. I'm going to take pictures. And uh, Stryker says, you know, it's not as easy as you think it is. Because you take a picture of a bigot, he looks just like somebody else. Take a picture of a racist, he looks like everybody else. How are you going to visualize what it is you want to visualize? And that's when he sent Parks, said, that's Dorothea Lange's file cabinet over there. Go look at her pictures. 
And when you're finished with her, go look at Walker Evans. When you're fisher, finished with Walker Evans, go look at Wa Russell Lee, and et cetera, and so on. And um, it's not clear how much, how much longer later, it was several weeks later, Parks is finished with that, and Stryker says, you see that um, housekeeper down at the end of the hall? This is in the offices of the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. It's late at night. He says, you see that housekeeper scrubbing, scrubbing the floor down there? Go talk to her. So Park said, what? He said, go talk to her. She might have something to teach you. So he goes down and introduces himself. And Parks is a very charismatic guy. So it's, no, it's, it's easy to imagine they got into an easy conversation. And he learned a lot about Ella Watson. One of the things he learned was that she was reasonably well-educated, um, was a high school graduate qualified to be a stenographer, but because of the color of her skin, she could not be a stenographer in the Department of Agriculture. And she's cleaning up in this office where this American flag is hanging. And he poses her, as he says, Grant Wood style, in front of the American flag, says, look into the camera, don't smile. And we get this picture. He's a, he shows it to Stryker after it's been developed and printed. Stryker said, you're going to get us in trouble. This is an indictment of America. Well, it's only, that's only halfway there, I think. Because, you know, Parks could not have indicted America if he hadn't believed in America. And what this is, is not simply Gordon Park's anger, but it's also his anguish at the fact that the promises of America that he deeply believed in and he wanted for himself and his family and his people, those promises symbolized by the flag just aren't available to Ella Wood because of who she was. I mean, she was everything you're supposed to be. You know, she's hardworking, she's respectable, she goes to church, she sacrifices for her family. She got as much, she got a good education. And remember, this is 1942, in a period where most people did not go to college. So she's highly educated, and there she is stuck scrubbing people's floors. So there's an ambivalence here, there is a tension here. And it's the tension between his belief in the American dream and his knowledge that sometimes it's withheld from people for reasons that have only to do with the color of their skin. So American dreams. I'm going to go fast through this because we all know that there are all kinds of American dreams and sometimes you're dreaming of a big car and sometimes you're dreaming of a nice house and sometimes you're dreaming of a good education for your kids, right? There are all kinds of American dreams. But um, Bill Clinton bless his heart, <laughs> gave us a really succinct um, definition. Work hard, play by the rules, and you should have a chance to go as far as your God-given ability will grant you. I mean, that's a nice, succinct uh, definition of the American dream, and I buy it. But of course, we all know that the American dream has never been there for everybody. This, these are not victims of the Depression. This is 1937. It's the 1937 Ohio River flood. And uh, life has sent Margaret Bork White to Louisville to take pictures of the people who are suffering. And it could just as easily have been white victims of the flood. This is not really about race. But it does capture that tension between the American dream, the belief in the American dream that we hold so dear, and the grim reality that it's not there for everybody. And we know that. We know it's not there for everybody. And if we don't know it, then somebody will tell us. <laughs> well, there's an African-American tradition of questioning the American dream, too. Fannie Lou Hamer, some of you may remember, was the leader, one of the leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And they went to the 1964 Democratic Party convention in Atlanta, uh, no, sorry, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And they demanded to be seated because they said that the other Mississippi delegation, the one that you think of as the official Mississippi delegation, it's all white, and it's all white by design. They won't let us participate. But we are an interracial Freedom Democratic Party, and we should be seated rather than they. Yeah, 
And she gave a famous, famous speech to the Credentials Committee. Um, and her refrain was, I question America. I'll get back to Fannie Lou Hamer. She's one of the great heroes of American history. But it goes back a long way. It goes back before Frederick Douglass, by the way. Um, but Douglass is an especially eloquent 19th century critic of, of the way that America runs its country. I love this quote. Uh, he's talking about those promises of justice and liberty and freedom. And he says, it's not for me, it's for you. And in fact, he understood. Aha, uh -huh, see, there's the timer. And I'm about a third of the way through this talk because of all the wonderful stuff that I found in Lorraine Madway's archive. Um, there have been lots of African-American critics. Uh, and, 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 you know, the thing is that for African-Americans, as this quote suggests, the American dream has always involved democracy, has always involved um, civil rights, has always involved the ability not simply to have a nice house or a nice car or financial security, but it's always been about also um, uh, having and making real the promises of American democracy and constitutional and civil rights. And we can see that running through. Let me stop on Fannie Lou Hamer just so you can see what she looked like. And there's a fuller quote from her speech to the Credentials Committee. Uh, they did not get seated, by the way, um, at the Democratic Convention. Martin Luther King. You know, here is Martin Luther King talking about that tension, the dream unfulfilled. Yes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But, um, you know, these words were written by the founder of my university. These words were written by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson's freedom, Thomas Jefferson's, what, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, everything that he was was built on the foundation of African slavery. You know, that is the tension. It's a real contradiction. It's not an anomaly. It is built into the fabric of this country. And fighting against that is part of what Gordon Parks wanted to do. So I'm going to skip on. There have been other perspectives, and it's important to say that the perspective that is given here by um, Booker T. Washington is one that um, many African Americans have also believed. Um, at the same time that there is this anguish and bitterness at being denied the full uh, benefits of American citizenship, there is also this sense that, OK, this is the way things are. Um, if you've got lemons, make lemonade um, and pull yourself up. And Mr. Parks <laughs> was the inheritor of both of these things, that he definitely understood the, the reality of racism and white supremacy in the United States, and he wanted to fight against it. But he was also somebody, you know, who did buy the kinds of things that Booker T. Washington was saying that, okay, well, this is your circumstances, now how are you going to respond to them? You know, and, and Park's answer to that was, I'm gonna respond in a couple of different ways. That I am going to use my typewriter and my camera as weapons against bigotry and hatred. He did. But, you know, the other thing that he wanted to do, and he succeeded at doing it, was to become rich and famous. He did. He wanted to, um, he wanted a variety of different things. He wanted to be rich and famous. He wanted to be a crusader against bigotry. He wanted to fulfill himself as an artist. He did all of these things. And, and I don't think he would have seen any contradiction at all in doing all of those things. I need to keep moving. But I placed Parks within a tradition of American photography I tried to place him within a tradition of African-American activists and intellectuals critiquing the American dream, American system, American democracy, the failures of American democracy. These next two men are also really important to him. Richard Wright, this is a quote from a book that he wrote in uh, 1941 called 12 Million Black Voices. 1941 was a time when 
there was a sense of optimism um, among black Americans. You know, part of that is that the Depression is coming to an end because World War II is coming to a beginning. But that meant there were more jobs, there was more opportunity. There was a slow opening up, a slow liberalization of race relations in the United States. It was a time of optimism. Uh, Parks got to know Richard Wright, got to know him in the United States, and then they reconnected when Parks went to France for Life magazine. They assigned him over there once he, when he started working for them. Richard Wright was an important influence, no question about it. And um, this kind of optimism, which Richard Wright did not carry through for the rest of his life, but this kind of optimism in 1941 is the kind of optimism that Parks had when he shows up in Washington, D.C. in 1942. And one of the reasons he, he responds so strongly to the way that he was treated in downtown Washington, D.C. was that he had come so full of life, so full of hope, so full of promise, and then he gets slapped down in the nation's capital, the seat of democracy. Yeah, that was a double shock. Ralph Ellison was also a friend. They were very close for a while. Ralph Ellison was a shutterbug, an amateur photographer who sometimes used his friend Gordon Park's darkroom in the basement of, Dar of Gordon Park's house. And, uh, you know, this is obviously a very different kind of quote. Um, they're from, the Richard Wright quote and this are from very, very close in time. This is just after the war, but that sense of perpetual alienation in the, light, in the land of his birth, I mean, both of these things will always be uh, part of, of Park's thinking about the place of uh, African Americans in the United States. And there's Parks himself. This is that kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of quote from his mother, his, in every autobiography and in every interview he talks about the importance of his mother and his way of thinking. And here's a quote about the choice of weapons. And I've been talking about his weapons as the typewriter and the camera. But you know what? Um, here, he's putting a very different spin on it, isn't he? He's saying, the choice of weapons, the significant thing was the choice of weapons with which to fight. I would accept those of my mother who place life, love, dignity, and hard work over hatred. Yeah. Wow, okay, so that's in his book, A Choice of Weapons, and it's, it's, it's both. I mean, you know, when I talk about Parks being a complicated and sometimes contradictory and mysterious figure, you know, if I were giving students a, um, a multiple choice quiz, I would say, the weapons of Gordon Parks are A, the camera and the typewriter, B, love, dignity, and hard work, or C, all of the above, obviously it's all of the above. It really is. No contradiction. Okay, so here's the part of the talk where I start moving really quickly because my beeper already went off. Um, you know, and, and I'm just going to show you a couple of the stories he did for Life magazine. Segregation story 1956, I've already showed you a little bit of this. Um, photographing it was a hellish experience for him. It's 1956 in the South. It's two years after Brown versus Board of Education where the Supreme Court declared that the segregation of American schools was inherently unconstitutional. Um, but the South, the white South, did not welcome that with open arms. In fact, it was a period of what was called massive resistance to the Supreme Court decision with the white South dragging its feet on the integration of public schools. It was also a time of the rise of the citizens' councils. I don't know if you've heard of the white citizens' councils of the South. Uh, they sometimes got called uh, the Klan in business suits. And these were the most respectable men in town banding together to make sure that integration did not happen and that Negroes stayed in their place. Um, they were violent. There was tremendous violence in the South at that time. And Parks, working for Life magazine, felt himself under threat every moment of the day. It's funny that the pictures don't show that. The pictures are in color. They're sometimes a little bucolic. To me, they don't reflect that anxiety they was feeling during the shooting of this story. And he, un he, he did sense that. He sensed it. And um, if you walk over to the Ulrich, you will see photographs from this story on the wall. And you'll say, I didn't see any photographs from this story on the wall. Well, they're in black and white. 
You know, when Parks published these subsequently in his books, and when he published them, uh, when he had them exhibited during his lifetime, he already, always had them exhibited in black and white, and he thought that color made it look too nice. Simple as that. He said this in an interview, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but he said that, that, that color took away the horror of what he saw down there, and he always wanted to do this in black and white. Well, he's doing a story about a, an extended family called the Thorntons, who are everything Americans ought to be. You know, they are an extended family. They're an extended, intact family with grandma and grandpa and, and uh, mother and father, husband and wife, kids, grandkids. Um, they're strivers. They work hard. The elder Thorntons made sure their kids got educated, at least through high school. Some went to college. One got a master's degree in science and teaching at an African-American university. They were everything that you're supposed to be. They were hardworking, they were decent, they were respectable, they were God-fearing, and yet the color of their skin held them back. This woman is a school teacher, and I really think that um, it was a shock for northern audiences to see a school teacher living like this, and to see a school that looks like the one over there with the stove, um, a cast iron stove for heating and cracks in the wall and school also had no plumbing by the way. Um, I think it was a real shock. I really do. That, um, and this is one of the stories where letters poured in and the letters were mixed. Most northerners wrote in and said this is really terrible. Most white southerners wrote in and said what's the problem? We don't see a problem here. It's the way things are supposed to be. You know, what? Um, but he did. He, this is the college professor with the MA teaches at, uh, taught at Tennessee State in uh, Nashville, the, the African-American school, historically black school in Nashville. Oh, I wanted to show you this spread just because um, that segregation story was part of a series that Life was doing on segregation in the South. There were five articles that were published in five different weeks and uh, Gordon's, Gordon Parks was the only one that had African-American subjects and where African-Americans spoke and African-Americans said their opinion. And so this one here, next week, Southern churchmen discuss the moral issues. And as you can see, there's not a black churchman among them. Life, <sighs> yeah, okay. So yeah, life was in favor of making things better for black people, but they weren't sure how much better they wanted things to be for black people. Black Muslims. Black Muslims were scary to African, uh, sorry, black Muslims were scary in 1930. They really were scary in 1963. Uh, and why not? I mean, the black Muslims had this fiery rhetoric and they called white people devils. And um, you say, white man's day is almost over. There's all this fierce rhetoric coming out of the black Muslims. You know, black Muslims devoted 90% of their attention to the African-American community. Yes, there was this fiery rhetoric, but they didn't do much with it. They were all about transforming the lives of African-Americans, especially those who were most down and out. Drug addicts, alcoholics, ex-offenders, and they were very good at transforming lives. And this is one of the things that Parks is trying to capture here. This quote, um, you know, Parks is coming from Life Magazine. And Elijah Muhammad, the head of the Nation of Islam, the black Muslims, challenged him. Now, this is a quote from one of his autobiographies, and it's actually from his last autobiography. And I don't think that Elijah Muhammad actually said this to him. In the earlier versions, where he's talking about his encounter with Elijah Muhammad, this quote isn't there at all. But I think this is psychological reality for Parks. I think he felt this challenged by Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Because one of the things they were saying to black people is we've got to, get, got to get away from white people. We've got to do for ourselves. We've got to build our own nation within a nation. And Park's affiliation with life, I think, really made him nervous. Any case, one of the things that, that Parks is doing is trying to demythologize the nation of Islam, to show that the nation of Islam isn't a bunch of crazies who want to come slit your throat in the middle of the night. It's the last thing the nation of Islam wanted to do. They were, in fact, trying to carve out their version of the American dream. 
You know, they were building families, they were building respectability, trying to get people on the right track. The whole thing was quite upsetting to Parks. It's when he starts um, providing text. This is the second time now that he's provided the text to go along with his stories, 1963. And he's going to do this to the end. He's going to provide the text. It's remarkable that he writes so directly within the pages of Life magazine, that he is um, using the first person, as you can see, and sometimes addressing right, um, Life's readers in the second person. It becomes very I, you, I, you, I, you. And he's exposing himself here. He's exposing his insecurities, exposing the, what you know, this encounter with the nation had done to him. And talking about, this is where he's talking about where he's placed professionally and at Life magazine. And he comes out here, which is remarkable, in 1963. I've had faith in America for so long as I can remember, but I've also been angry, even bitter. It's now time for America to justify this belief I have in her and to show me I've not believed in vain. Yeah, wow, there's that anguish, huh? That anguish, that anguish, the belief, I want to believe, I want to believe in you. But you've got to change. You've got to change. You've got to show me that you're worthy of it. This tension continues, and... Um, through Harlem family. There are many others I'm, 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 I'm not showing you, but Harlem family is one that he did on deeply impoverished family in Harlem. Here he's talking about Harlem retrospectively, but these are the quotes that I think are more important. He opens this photo essay with a prose poem, where here, here we've got the IU. For I am you, look at me, and to know that to destroy me is to destroy yourself. He's talking to whites, tens of, uh, life's tens of millions of white readers, and very directly. He's also, you know, this is 1968. I have to say that the photography was done uh, before the assassination of Martin Luther King. So he is not showing that despair. But, you know, the optimism that might have characterized the civil rights movement of the early 1960s had certainly changed by 1968. And the incredible, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The incredible solidity, the, um, the inertia of white supremacy and white racism in the United States was all too apparent by 1968. Saying, look, we've passed these laws, we've desegregated. Even if we haven't integrated, we've desegregated. But still, you know, this intractable poverty for so many. Well, this story, too, touched hearts and minds. I mean, there was this outpouring of emotion from Life's readers. They sent in money to Life magazine. The family was moved out of Harlem. They were given a new house. The father was found a job and all sorts of things. And, you know, it's, it's incredible that, that Parks really did move people, you know? It's, it's not me saying that he wrote powerful text and that he made amazing photographs, but I can say that he moved. He shifted American society. How much? I don't know. But he shifted it to some degree. It's funny, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, life, of course, did a issue that was almost entirely dedicated to the funeral. There are none of Gordon Park's photographs in there. None. He didn't make any photographs, or at least none got published. But they published his essay. And it's this fierce essay, it's this angry essay, it's this despairing essay. We are angry, all of us. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I was alive in 1968. I was in junior high school. We were angry. All of us. No matter what everybody, anybody else tells us, you pushed us to the precipice. You know, he's talking about Martin Luther King. He calls Martin Luther King a man who did what you wanted to do. He protested peacefully, and you have shot him down. He's talking to the life's readers, and he's saying, you. He's not letting anybody off the hook here. You have shot him down. This death of this great man does not unite us. We are committing ourselves to suicide. It's a very bleak moment in Park's, um, it's a very bleak moment in Park's life. And I think this bleakness and this despair 
this unhappiness, is one of the reasons that he leaves photojournalism. He doesn't do it in 1968, but he's weaning himself off of, of photojournalism because I think he has lost his belief in his ability to change the hearts and minds of white America. He has lost his faith in the ability of photographs to shift race relations in this country. So he's shooting very little for Life magazine, then Life goes out of business in 1972. And Parks has already gone on to other things. You know, in late 1960s, he's already making movies. Early 1970s, he makes Shaft, which you know, not only makes him famous, he's already been famous, uh, makes him a celebrity, it makes him a wealthy man, it gives him the freedom to do all sorts of other different things, including to make more movies. So he's gone on. And he, you know, look, I mean, his movies do address African-American topics. Shaft is about an African-American private detective. Um, it's wish fulfillment for um, adolescent African-American boys like me. We loved Shaft because he kicked ass. He kicked white ass, and we loved it. Um, he made the first um, um, adaptation of the great slave narrative uh, by Solomon Northrup, 12 Years a Slave, which was just a couple of years ago an Academy Award winning movie. Did a biographical movie on a blues man, uh, Lead Belly. Good movies, good movies, and worthy. But he's also trying to figure out America and trying to figure out his relationship to Kansas and especially to Fort Scott. And, you know, you probably know the story that. He didn't want to come back to Fort Scott. He didn't want to be buried in Fort Scott. Um, you know, he remembered how he'd been treated in Fort Scott. Was Fort Scott, when he was growing up, was a very segregated town. Segregated schools, segregated movie theaters, segregated lunch counters, segregated neighborhoods, segregated cemetery. And the cemetery, it's Evergreen Cemetery. It's near Fort Scott Community College. You go, to, go there and you think, okay, so this is a segregated cemetery. Let me see if I can figure out which is which. And you say to yourself, I bet the white part of the cemetery is that nice high hillside covered in trees and it's very, very beautiful. And I bet the black part is down there at the bottom where all the water drains and it's kind of swampy and mushy and the, water, and the ground squishes under your feet. And you would be exactly right. And um, it wasn't until that cemetery was desegregated that he said, I will come home. And he did. He came home. That's not his grave, that's a memorial, but it's near his grave. Um, there's a poem on it. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but um, he says essentially, I'm happy to be home. I'm buried near my father, near my mother, near my son, one of his sons, predeceased him. He says, I haven't forgotten all the bad stuff. <laughs> it's there, it's real, it shapes the world in which we live but I found peace within it. I think he found that about America too. Um, we don't forget. We can't forget. We live the history that America has lived. It shapes us. It shapes us as individuals and it shapes us as communities and as people. But we find reconciliation. So, you know, Parks has not been understood in this kind of depth and co he hasn't gotten what his due. He hasn't gotten his due. He hasn't been recognized as not just the great artist, but you know the profound thinker and doer that he really was. Thank you.